আমাদের চোখের আড্ডা ওয়েলকাম ইউ অল টু দিস সেশন এন্ড দ্য টুডে চেয়ারম্যান ইজ প্রফেসর মমসা কুদিন আহমেদ ইজ দ্য ভাইস চ্যান্সেলর অফ বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিব বিশ্ব ইউনিভার্সিটি এন্ড চেয়ারম্যান অফ ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ কমিউনিটি অফ থার্মোলজি the immediate past president of bangladesh ophthalmological society president of bangladesh plastic surgeon society and vice president of ophthalmic plastic society of south south asia he was the ex secretary general of bangladesh medical education he is true leader and he is leading the ophthalmic plastic society of bangladesh professor gulam haider He is the pioneer of oculoplastic surgeon in Bangladesh and he is the professor and director of medical education Bangladesh Eye Hospital in Kandu and general secretary of oculoplastic society of South Asia and Bangladesh Oculoplastic Surgeon Society He is the recipient of Motin Motin Gold Medal Oak from OSP and APAO Achievement Award and he has many other awards in his name and today but man in man of main person is professor ashok kumar gopastar he is awarded he was awarded padma shri by the president of india and he is the chairman of vision eye center chairman department of ophthalmology sardangaram hospital new delhi president of oculoplasty society of south asia past president of asia pacific society of oculoplasty and reconstructive surgery He was the president of All India Ophthalmological Society and Oculoplastic Association of India. So we can see that he is a true leader in this subcontinent in oculoplasty. And we are so fortunate and so privileged to have with him with us today and it is a great opportunity for us to have some chit chat or interactive talks with him. So sir we are very happy to have you with us. Thank you. and we have some participants these are young ophthalmologists oculoplastic surgeons who are doing oculoplasty practices in bangladesh and they are they have many queries when they do the surgery so they deal with the patient so they have come up with their questions and uh, we'll go go through their experience and we'll share with the with the oculoplastic our leader the The participants are Dr. Nishad Parvin. She is working at National Institute of Ophthalmology as associate professor. Dr. Mehboobul Kader, he is assistant professor. He is working in Czech Resolution Nursa uh, Institute of Ophthalmology. Dr. Muttuza Nuruddin, he is he is working as a consult senior consultant at uh, Chevron Eye Hospital. Dr. Narayan Chandra Bhumik, he is assistant professor and work an RS. working at Bardem I I department of Bardem hospital then Dr Shafiul Mustafi he is the oculoplastic fellow they all did fellowship in oculoplasty and he is the assistant professor of oculoplasty at National Institute of Ophthalmology then Dr Ismail Hussain he is also the assistant professor of oculoplasty at National Institute of Ophthalmology Dr Rifat Rashid she is senior consultant at Istamia I hospital oculoplasty department dr abid akbar he is consultant of oculoplasty and oncology at vision eye hospital dr utpal kumar kundo he is the assistant professor working at oculoplasty department of national institute of ophthalmology and dr shoma roy she is senior consultant at chitagong eye infirmary and he, she has fellowship in retinoblastoma also Uh, now and i am your moderator and i am the organizer i am professor shabudra shakar mili and i am doing uh, i am working as professor of community of ophthalmology at national institute of ophthalmology and doing and serving at um, uh, unit head of oculoplasty oculoplasty and orbit uh, so this is me now we will go to the main program so let's start and uh so so that was the introductory introduction of our all faculties here and now we'll have a very brief um welcome speech from our chairman 
Professor Sharputin Amritsar. Sir? Professor Sharputin Amritsar, are you there? Yes. Can yes, you hear sir. me? Yes, sir. Okay, I am audible. Yes. Uh, I am very happy that Professor Shakutara Shakur is not only the uh, organizer of this uh, Chokhe Radda, it means relaxation by discussing ocular problems, especially oculoplastic problems. So this is the uh, main theme of this uh, today's discussion. Uh, there are two professors of community ophthalmology in Bangladesh. I am number one. Second one is Shakotara Shakur. So uh, we are not only the professor of community ophthalmology, we are also oculoplasty surgeon. And also you see uh, the name is not the main thing. Professor Ashok Kumar Grover, he is not now only of India. He is the best oculoplasty surgeon, best ophthalmologist, who was awarded by the president of India, Paddosri, and he is now a global uh, uh, oculoplasty surgeon. We are very happy that today uh, he is with us. It means India-Bangladesh friendship is still uh, persists. It will be, uh, I think, it will be long-lasting forever. And Ashok Kumar Govar, he has helped us a lot. The young participants whose name was uh, uttered a few minutes back, all of them are, have the access to Ashok Kumar Govar and also not only Sar, uh, Sar Gangaram Hospital, uh, Delhi conferences uh, in uh, India, and also uh, AIMS. All of them are exposed to that part. The uh, Society of Thalmic, uh, Ophthalmologist of my university, we will have the collaboration with Sar Gangaram and also AIMS, as because our future oculoplasty surgeon will be able to uh, have some exposure, which will be helpful for the people of our country in future. Today, I think our participants, uh, they will learn a lot from Professor Ashok Kumar Grover. Uh, if I would stay with you up to 2.30, I will be able to learn a uh, few. But after 2.30, I am to leave for another meeting. Before that, I will welcome Professor Ashok Kumar Grover, my co-chairman, the main man, the main woman, Professor Shakutara Shakur will be there as, a, as an organizer. So uh, today's uh, uh, relaxation mood, will be with the discussion of eye, oculoplasty, uh, plastic surgery, uh, retinoblastoma, everything will be discussed today. And I think uh, mucormycosis, I was asking you in a uh, few minutes earlier, that in our country, we also got about six patients, uh, mucormycosis, still two patients are there admitted uh, in uh, my uh, university in the ophthalmology and otolaryngology. Together, we are working on it. And uh, before, uh, when I saw that you people uh, in a webinar, you told me, uh, Professor Ashok Kumar Gobar, that you got uh, 35 patients in two months and 19 had the exentration. Then uh, we became alert and we found that there are six patients, two patients have already died and two have uh, needed of exentration and two are uh, surviving. And you know, that it is so costly that all the patients could not use it. Uh, I got this mycormycosis in my country with those patients who are much more in the ICU, who had the uncontrolled diabetes, who are using the steroid. Immunity was very uh, less. Immunocompromised patients were much more uh, during, uh, as a patient, one of the patients was carcinomatous all suffers from even uh, black fungus or mucormycosis. I had some uh, uh, observation that in your country, during this uh, COVID uh, with Delta variant, there were industrial oxygen use and the humidifier and industrial oxygen, which was not sterile, that could cause this mycormycosis much more. Another thing I thought that in your country, there was uh, some people are immunocompromised and they were not in a position to use uh, the drugs which are needed. And some of the people 
who were using the nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula, there was injury in the nose. So the paranasal sinuses and also the orbit, everything were uh, disrupted. Uh, I will not take much more of the time as because uh, our uh, uh, guest, Professor Ashok Kumar Gobar, will answer all the questions will be asked by our panelists. I hope that our panelists will ask such questions which will be helpful for not only for them, it will be helpful for our future residents because many of the residents will also uh, join in this uh, conversation. I hope uh, we will... Thank you, sir. You are always an inspiration for us and your this speech will inspire the young ophthalmologists more. And now uh, I request Professor Gulam Haider, sir, the co-chairman of today's session, to give a brief speech. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. to organizing the program. I think this program will be very attractive and beneficial to all the fellows of our countries and also for our, 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 myself also. Because Professor Ekengoba, sir, is the senior most occupied surgeon and best surgeon, I think, Asian specific regions, and as well as whole over the world, he's well known. All the British surgeons of whole over the world, not only Asia specific, because I know him very well from the beginning, in my early university days from 2000. Professor Gurbha, the Professor Gurbha. And we're also delighted by getting Professor Bethariya. He is the boss of the boss, who was for whole India. He is also with us. Thank you, Professor Petharia. So, Thank you, sir. So, I, I feel that this program will be highly beneficial for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Mook, Mook, uh, Dr. Professor Shaku, for organizing the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, now you know that the boss of the boss is with us. Eh? Professor Dithariya is with us. Boss is with us. So it will be going to be a very interactive session and will be, it will be helpful for us all. So we'll start now, sir, Shukro uh, Kumar Grover, sir, with our first um, question. It will be coming from Dr. Abid Akbar. He, 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 continuously, he wanted to be the first one. To question you. Just yes. before the question yes. starts. Most courageous. Yes. Ask your question, Abid. Just before the question, may I uh, take this opportunity to thank yes. Professor Sharfuddin, Professor Golam Ahmed, Professor Shawakat Shakur, and the entire Bangladesh Oculoplastic Surgeons team for this opportunity to be together. I think the whole purpose of uh, us getting together either uh, in the forum of Asia Pacific Oculoplastic Society or more importantly of the South Asian Association for Oculoplastic Society was to be able to share each other's problems, to share each other's difficulties and be able to preempt them like the if we see a mucormycosis problem in our country, we should be able to share and warn you about its prevention. And collaborate together because we face so many similar problems. Our resources are similar, our hospitals are similar, our patients are similar, and the nature of pathology is similar. So it is very vital that we work together. And I'm glad that this association has been so fruitful amongst all our countries, and especially with Bangladesh. And I've been to Bangladesh uh, four times, five times. And... Uh, each has been a very, very fruitful experience and a very useful. And I've made so many friends. It's lovely to be with all of you. And it's a great opportunity to discuss, have a freewheeling discussion. This is such a wonderful idea that we can discuss any aspect under the sun. Dr. Shakur was kind enough to send me some questions late last night. And I've been able to put together some slides also for some of the questions and uh, I'll use them wherever required. And uh, 
Um, the other questions are most welcome. Are there many spontaneous questions that may come up now? And again, it is great to have all of you and it is wonderful to have Professor Bitharia, our guide and mentor in this program as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you, um, Bangladesh team. Thank you, sir. Um, so, Abhi. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, sir, Ashok Kumar, sir, uh, good, uh, good noon, sir. I am Dr. Abid Akbar, uh, consultant, Vision Eye Hospital, Okulu Pasti. Uh, sir, I have a first question. Uh, I'm, I uh, face this uh, type of uh, problem uh, invariably because I do uh, laser this year uh, and I hold the camera. Also, I when my patient uh, do laser this year surgery, I uh, do laser and uh, hold the camera in ENT surgeon. But many of cases, um, we uh, are organize a session to surgeon. One is uh, cameraman uh, and another is uh, laser uh, probe. So uh, one patient came from uh, me as a, uh, a 40 years old, right eye on SPT, right eye, is NLD patent in left eye, there is a lower canaliculi block. At what distance from the punctum? Years old lady. Uh, what we do, DCR or DCT surgeon? What distance from the punctum? What is the distance of the block? So, uh, madam, uh, the block from uh, only punctum is located, but after uh, doing a Bowman's lacrimal probe, uh, use the Bowman's lacrimal probe, there is no entry and uh, there is no communication in lower canaliculi. What about the upper canaliculus? Is it patent? Upper, uh, yes, madam, sir, upper canaliculus is patent. And there is no associated nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Yes, sir. Uh, when upper canaliculi uh, 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 use the upper canaliculi SP, in SPT, use upper canaliculi and there is a lacrimal sac area is swelled up. Okay. So there, there is a nasolacrimal duct obstruction as well and there yes. is a mucus discharge on pressing the sac area? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we are dealing with a combined nasolacrimal duct obstruction and a lower canaliculi lower block. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, in many of these situations, a simple DCR does the trick. Upper canaliculus takes up the function very well, remarkably well in the absence of lower canaliculus. And you can avoid any of the other riskier procedures or more elaborate procedures by simply doing a dacrocystorhinostomy with a very wide uh, bony opening and a very good... Um, marsupialization of the sac, both creation of a very good anterior flap and suturing, and you are likely to get asymptomatic very well. I think that will be the best solution in this. If both canaliculi are obstructed, then we go into more elaborate procedures, and there are several questions on conjunctivo DCR. We will talk about them. There, if you've had a recent injury uh, to the canaliculus by the laser, you can think of a uh, treating it as a canalicular injury. But with less elaborate procedure, you can simply try doing a mini monoka intubation. If you had a recent injury and you're managing it within a few days before fibrosis has occurred, go ahead and simply use um, mini monoka tube. And um, if any apposition is required around, you can do that as well. And that will work many a times by leaving the tube in for about six weeks to prevent fibrosis. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I'm, uh, my next question, uh, another uh, DCI related. Uh, Abit, Abit, please, Amit, to Yekur Goeshate. Okay, okay. Well, sir, you uh, uh, participate. Yes, at this point, I have a question. So uh, I uh, want to complete this uh, question at, at this time. Can I permit? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Sir, uh, Grover, sir, uh, in this question, I have a patient. Uh, 
uh, that patient has uh, laser DCR two times, two years back, but SPT is blocked. Both canaliculi is blocked. SPT implies? So SAC patency SPT. test. SAC patency test. Okay. okay. SAC patency test, but the block is, uh, by probing, block is at the lateral part of the canaliculi, both canaliculi. Uh, in that case, we, sh we should do uh, CDCR, canaliculodactrosisterhinostomy with Lister Jones tube intubation. But in absence, Lister Jones tube is not available in our country. In absence of Lister Jones tube, uh, what uh, can we manage this case, sir? Okay. So you have well established obstructions at proximal canaliculi, both yes, the upper yes. as well as the lower. So maybe I'll go on to some of the slides that I've put together on that. So uh, can you see my slides? Uh, sir, can't, you can't see, sir. You can't see my slide? No, yes, sir. No, sir. Okay, okay. I'll just reshare this. Yes, okay. we can. We yes, can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll see it. So I'll go search the area of the conjunctival DCR that I've put together. Uh, and I'll talk about there was a question on how to make conjunctival DCR successful. I'll also talk about the alternatives available. And one option that I've used very often now, I'll start with that, uh, which often circumvents the need for use of the um, conjunctival DCR. My conjunctival DCR rates have come down after I started using bottle and toxin injections for epiphora with punctal or canalicular stenosis. So as you see here, I expose the palpebral part of the lacrimal gland and use um, insulin syringe, use 2.5 units of Botox into the palpebral lobe of uh, lacrimal gland. And this works in a fairly large percentage, almost 75 to 80 percent patients are the epiphora is taken care of and we can get them to be asymptomatic. It works for a duration of about six months. We can repeat the injection at six months and maybe another time on a third occasion. And many of these patients you will find have a permanent decrease in reflex secretion to an extent that they are comfortable. So if this solution works, it can be a major, major advantage and you are avoiding a surgery. In other cases where you require to do a surgery, we'll just look at the conjunctival DCR. There were a lot of questions, so a lot of slides have been put together. <laughs> But I'll show you the slides of conjunctival DCR. I put it in the order that I received the questions. Um, Some of them can't join right now. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. I'll search them and. Okay, so these are the slides of conjunctival DCR. So this was one of the questions. So, but the first question is, you don't have a Jones tube, what to do? So we, yes, sir. we started with the similar situation where we had no tubes. So what we did was we started using the intracat, the, uh, the simple uh, butterfly. The, the, you have a polythene tube in that. So if you flame on Bunsen's burn, on any burner in the oxidizing flame with a very brief exposure, you can form a funnel at the uh, apex. And you can use that as a Jones tube. It has a lot of disadvantages. It does not have a very good capillarity. So it tends to get obstructed very often. So the next step that we did was we had an indigenous tube made. So you could use polythene tubes, Pyrex glass tubes. Of course, if you don't have Jones tubes, you won't uh, 
easily get met for coated tubes as well. There is a stop loss tube also. Some people have used mucous membrane draft for this purpose. But this is one option which you can get any of your glass blowers to make. So since Pyrex glass tubes have certain advantages, Pyrex glass or borosil glass, we got these made by one of those people who make the, you know, the churi that uh, girls wear on the hands. So some of those makers, we motivated them to make this with the borosil glass. And we have these available now from a um, manufacturer in near Agra. There is a place called Firozabad, which is specializing in making um, glasses, glass or churi. So we got them to make this. And uh, with defined dimensions, we gave them the dimensions with a flange here, with the, um, a bevel here, we could easily get a tube made. So you can easily have that made and um, start using it in those cases which do not respond to any other means. And we'll talk about the surgical technique also briefly now because that was one of the questions on how to improve the results. So what we do is, after we have fashioned the posterior flaps and featured them, which of course is not necessary, it is more important to make good anterior flaps. This is the anterior flap, which you can see now. Then you do a caruncolectomy. Then you create the opening for the tube using a bent needle, hypodermic, usual bent needle of 21 gauge and make a track so that you are making a dependent position. You're going from the medial canthus into the nose, but with a dependent oblique position that the drainage of the tube can take place. Then you can use any of these knives. This is a, a one graphes knife, but you can use a simple 15 degree blade to go along that needle to create the track for the tube. So then you need to measure what the size of the tube that you require is. So you pass a probe along that track and see how much of it passed till it reached the nose. Of course, it is most helpful if you can see the position of the tube in the nose. So that is very helpful. So this is how we are doing it. Is it endoscopically? To be short of the nasal septum by about two millimeters. If you measure about 18, you have you need a tube which is which will not abut against the medial canthus. It will go in that oblique but dependent way so that the, the tears can drain. And then when you place the tube using a support. So if there's a probe within this and we are pushing it along the track that we have created so that only this bevel is left, but this bevel should be visible so that the fluid can drain into it and that you can carry out your syringing post-operatively. You also pass a proline suture along the glass tube so that you can then fixate it to conjunctival tissue or lid tissue. And then you suture the anterior flap. So we are putting the glass tube in. So you can see the position in the nose through the DCR, or if uh, we'll talk about the alternative procedure also, then you anchor it, feature the anterior flap after that. And you are set, you're now fixing the suture that you had passed within the tube through the entire lumen, you will pass and keep a needle of that suture and you will pass it through the lid to fixate it with a proline suture, which can stay in position without causing irritation. Post Check it post-operatively, taking care to use proper anti-inflammatory antibiotics, enzymes, and post-operative advice not to blow <laughs> Stabilize tube before sneezing. Keep doing reverse wall salva by closing mouth, closing nose to breathe through the tube so that the tube remains patent. And if any problem takes place, follow up promptly. So these are the steps that you take so to make sure that your patency remains. Okay. So, but there is a simpler way. Now, an alternative method that is used is 
without DCR. If you do not have a SAC, obvious SAC problem, you can simply go through the medial canthus using a trocar. One of the trochas or one of the thicker needles that you have, or you can use that from the caruncle area into the nose under direct endoscopic visualization. And you can place your tube through that tract and suture it. The results are possibly not as good as they are with the, the conventional conjunctivo day PCR that I showed you, but that saves a lot of time and effort. And in many cases, it does work. So this in brief was about the options if you have a canalicular obstruction, but start with Botox, it will work. The only possible hey. side effects are that you may get a ptosis which may be temporary for a few weeks. Thank, thank you, you, Professor thank Gobar. You, okay, thank you, uh, Professor Gobar. I am to leave now, but I have learned a lot from you, including Botox and this type of uh, bevel glass, which is uh, uh, present in uh, Delhi, where they are making this thing. Thank you very much. I am to leave now. Later on, we will see you again. I hope this type of discussion will be very much helpful for our uh, future oculoplastic and uh, recent mm -hmm. oculoplastic surgeon of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sharfuddin. Okay. Uh, Grover, Grover, sir, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, a very nice demonstration it was. And uh, this was actually my question how to improve the success rate with John's tube. Uh, I have done a number of cases uh, uh, in both the procedures, the procedures with DCR and without DCR. The main problem what I have faced is uh, sir, extrusion of the tube. I think around 50% of my cases have come uh, within three months or uh, six months with the extrusion of the tube. So that's why, sir, I asked this question, whether you face the same problem or uh, I think there might be some uh, mistake in my techniques or whatever. That's why, sir, I asked this question. You are using a glass tube, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I actually, I have imported this all from USA. Uh, I have a number of John's tube from USA. So these are very good material and everything was fine. But still, patients are coming with extrusion. So that's why I was surprised why so much failure rate. So I have mostly, I have done, sir, in closed technique without this year. That... That may be a reason, maybe, I don't know. But uh, with an open method, when you combine it with the DCR, um, it, they certainly improve. Second, are you fixating the tube to the eyelid with your pulling suture? Uh, I'm not actually with the eyelid, but uh, I just uh, make a roll around the, uh, uh, around the flinch and then I suture it with the caruncle. That I do. Yeah, that sometimes doesn't work because one, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, uh, suture that you may place around the funnel, that gets displaced and uh, uh, it comes out easily. So if you are passing it through the entire lumen and taking it out outside, putting the knot inside the lumen, then it is much more secure. And okay. then you take a bite which comes out both threads through the eyelid and position it, then the anchorage is much stronger. Now, okay. this anchorage is particularly important in the early post-operative period when mucus closure of the, um, because of the inflammation, mucus closure is more likely. Once that phase passes where the tube is getting obstructed, it is much less liable to be pushed out because then air is going through that and the fluid is going through that. So initial period is more important to guard against. More protection with sutures is important. Maintaining patency is important. So syringing may yes. be required. And then training involves salva. Okay. So these things, if it remains patent, it will not get extruded so often. It will still happen. You will still get the granulation tissue at the opening of the mouth, but you have to keep tackling them. And uh, then these procedures work. So there is, and then of course, there is a stop loss tube available in UK. So if you check on the net, you will easily find the stop loss tube, which has a another uh, flange created below the area where the uh, funnel is, now which prevents the loss of tube or extrusion of tube. You can use all those options. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sir another question with the use of Botox. Uh, I have used actually Botox for patients with uh, crocodile tear. Uh, 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 in, this is also another, uh, I, I've learned one more thing. Uh, but my question is, sir, uh, is there, does this patient develop 
dry eye symptoms after using botox in the uh, no. lacrimal gland no since we are only blocking the reflex secretion which is coming from the main lacrimal gland palpebral lacrimal gland not the basic secretions which are coming from glands of krause and wolfring in okay. our so we we don't block the basic basal secretions and we do not cause a dry eye okay one thing sir i want to talk about the <clears throat> canicular stenosis i will you i am using botox also on last six uh, one year and in where as at nio national institute those cases have been canicular canicular stenosis or i basically conventional dcr have done but entry flap of the lacrimal sac and giving first of all giving a communication within the medial canthus entry flap lacrimal sac reverse way pull it and up to the medial canthus making a hole and then this is the core and roof is formed by the buccal buccal mucous membrane and then to maintain the patency uh, i using tube few of my cases you know at that time 25% case i success but centimeter since is fail patency is not maintained yeah so innovative way of doing things yes they they all whenever you innovate something there are difficulties on the way failures on the way until you keep improving and keep Uh, getting better and better results. I'm trying, sir. I'm trying. Modify. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> wonderful interaction. Wonderful discussion is going on. Very nice, sir. Maybe the next one to ask question. Naram, you want to go with your questions now? Naram, Abi Dagbar, a second question. Okay, Abi. You finish your. Uh, thank you, madam. Another next question. uh dcr uh, related uh, where patient is 70 years uh, complains with watering and discharge history of uh, conventional dcr operation 10 years back and regurgitation test is positive when i do sac patency test i do again nasolacrimal duct block common canaliculi and lower among and upper canaliculi are open what we do redcr or laser dcr sir i think laser dcr had very good results initially but uh, gradually it has been realized that long term results are not so good and long term obstructions are coming back because we are possibly not able to make that large an opening and to a complete Hello. marsupialization of the sac Hello. and a complete uh, uh, take care of the possibility of sump syndrome and so on so that is possibly the reason why laser dcr is probably not working as well but an endoscopic uh, uh, examination will tell you much more you see the bony opening is still very good and you can just make a small opening with the laser and intubate it and use some mitomycin it may work out and that may make a very simple procedure but alternately most often i would do a, a repeat dactylostomy sir i am sure to see as we have outlined is an anastomosis obstruction we have the anastomosis has got obstructed again and this approach in these cases to me unless of course you feel the bony opening is very good then you can do go go ahead endo nasally and just open up the area of the mucosa but most of these cases have thick of the anastomosis so what you need to do is so what you need to do is uh and like an external dcr go and open the area of the bony opening remove all the obstructive tissue or scar tissue in front of the common canalicular opening and make we retain just a small flap in that area then you make bony opening larger particularly on the anterior side to get fresh anterior mucosa 
on the nasal side. If you have a significant nasal mucosa, most of the times you can get fresh virgin mucosa from the nose. If you can get that and prepare a good flap and anastomose it to the structure that you have in front of the common canaliculus, you are able to succeed combining it with one, four minutes of mitomycin C, 0.04%, uh, and uh, secondly, combining it with silicon intubation. So these cases, you can get fairly high success rates if you follow this principle. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we go with Joseph's questions? Who has Joseph's questions? Ma'am, I have a Tosis question. Yes, go, go ahead with your question. Um, good evening, sir. We discussed a lot about lecumal now. Good evening, Dr. Soma. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, uh, my question in case of uh, Tosis with Marcus Khan Joe Winking. Uh, actually, sometimes we feel that after uh, doing the Tosis and excision of the muscle, they still there is a uh, Joe Winking moment and patient complains with this. So, uh, what should we do actually? How long uh, this uh, muscle should be excised from the original ligament? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. The most important thing is good dissection of the levator aponeurosis from the conjunctiva mullus, cutting off its, I want to do sling also in the same procedure. So I do not dissect on the tarsal plate. I dissect the levator aponeurosis very well from conjunctiva and millers in its entire extent. Make sure I cut the medial and the lateral horns safely, direct vertically, so that I don't injure any lacrimal structure or superior uh, equally. Once I have done that complete excision and made the levator aponeurosis totally free, I, I have I removed the orbital septum, dissected up to the vitnal ligament very carefully, and excised right up to the vitnal ligament. I don't need to cut the vitnal ligament and the there is no effective action left on the uh, tarsal plate where, where it is uh, really working. So no attachments in the surrounding lid or on the tarsal plate left for the action of levator to the main. And this is able to cause a, a, a very good disablement of the levator aponeurosis for all my cases. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Soma. I hope that answers it completely. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll try it again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I have one question. Sir, do yes. you do L, uh, supermaximal LPS? Supermaximal. Okay. That's, a, that's a, again an excellent question. So, what are the options that we have for somebody who has uh, just a uh, levator action of four millimeters or less? or where we are going at uh, doing a disabling uh, of the elevator as in jogging. So what are the options? Now, um, super maximal was a popular procedure earlier, but as the importance of Vitnals was recognized, it was recognized that super maximals are not really doing us a great advantage by sacrificing, dissecting all the way up. You are dissecting the integrity of the um, Vitnal ligament. So what has been realized is that the retaining Vitnals is much more important and you can instead do a Vitnals thing. As you know, Vitnals is only 15 or 16 or 18 millimeters away from the tarsus. And uh, dissecting that far without cutting off any horns so that all the action is retained and taking permanent sutures like proline through the tarsal plate and past above the Vitnals, you are able to get a good correction in many cases. Although I'm a relative skeptic for those with poor action uh, with doing a retinal thing because may, many of these come back after six months. You get a good elevation immediately, but you get, get back the reversal over a period of time in many of these cases. But yes, that is one of the options if you're not planning a sling. In these cases, with about four to five millimeter levator action, doing a Vitnals thing works well. Only in those cases where Vitnals is not defined and the muscle is uh, 
relatively poor or muscle is degenerated or has fatty degeneration, do you sometimes do a super maximal dissection? But then you have to be careful about conics prolapse. And sometimes it doesn't work because of a degenerated muscle, even with super maximal dissection. So super maximal dissection has become very rare now. I hardly ever do it. And secondly, it is uh, not very effective. Yes, sir. I, also I would like to do a study. Yes, sir. So uh, also uh, I read in some, uh, some literatures that as the LPS function is poor and there is no power, so it droops again. So that is also one, uh, one uh, factor of its failure. So for the, for the youngsters, sir, what you suggest? Uh, for supermaximal, it's better not to do that for them. And <laughs> if levator action is five or less, I would rather do a frontalis sling. Yeah. And with the availability of silastic, it's become a very easy procedure. Fascial eta was a relatively more demanding procedure. For those, for me, that is still the gold standard. But for as an alternative, silastic sling is a is an excellent procedure. In Bangladesh, we don't get this very, like, uh, not available. Uh, and the patients, sometimes they can't afford also in my government hospital. But uh, do you do the Pashalata very regularly? Oh, Pashalata? yes. Yeah. Very That's regularly. the gold standard, yes. All cases that agree to a bilateral surgery, I would always do a Pashalata. Thank you. Sir, I have one question, sir. So I have one question. Yes, Professor Gwela. On the bus, bus suspension, by using fascia either or or lab, no problem. But frontal muscle function, is it important to see before frontal suspension surgery? Mm -hmm. I'm, always, I'm always doing that more than important years. Um, but yeah, to see whether the frontalis does work or frontalis does lift. Because there are those cases who get a habitual, what is called a habitual palsy or apparent undercorrection in spite of you having done a very good correction on the table. So it is something that we do look at, but it is not very consistent that you find a, a very good correlation with that. Because many, you have a, um, if it is a unilateral ptosis, you often notice that the brow is elevated, which implies that the patient is used to um, making use of his frontalis and those cases are more likely to work rather than those where you don't find a compensatory brow elevation. But then again, if you, you do a fascia lata in them, you still end up with undercorrection because fascia lata does, unilateral fascia lata in these cases is not able to overstretch like the uh, silastic is. Silastic has that elasticity which allows you to overstretch and do a little overcorrection, which takes care of the less use of frontalis in many of these cases. So that is the advantage. If I were to do a unilateral procedure, I would much rather do a silastic rather than a uh, uh, fascia lata. I would assess the frontalis action, but it is not as reliable a measure as say a levator action is. What is your experience, Professor Golam, on this? We'll talk to Professor Bitharia also. I have seen uh, every case I usually uh, see the function of frontalis muscle. If more than 10 meter functions, I expect that result will be good. If there's a 10 meter function, sometimes oh. result will not be good. We can uh, get opinion from the uh, Professor Bitharia, sir, also. Professor Bitharia, oh. What is your opinion on uh, front measuring frontal frontalis action before doing sling surgery? So frontalis action is uh, very important because it is in frontalis sling we are attaching the sling material to the frontalis. So frontalis uh, action uh, should be there. And uh, I agree with you, Ashok, that uh, we can use elastic material only thing in the sling is that we have to put the lead margin uh, at the limbus or shed little over the limbus because once you bury the knot, you find that the lead margin comes down 
up Absolutely. to limbus and later on after six months it covers uh, one to 1.5 millimeters as we want so we have to plan little over correction and bury the knot very nicely that's the main key point in the sling surgery burying the knot whether yes. you use special atom whether you use elastic to my mind that is not a very important thing and elastic i would go in for elastic it is easy and you do not cause any morbidity and another incision on the thigh so i think uh, that will be very useful and uh, if you have the frontal is action the results will be very nice thank you sir doctor so now there was some question on entropion i think who, who asked those questions can you go with that those entropion uh yes ma'am uh, i have question yeah uh, uh sir uh, in senal entropion sometimes we find uh, some mongoloid patients or uh, some uh, old patients who has the shrunken eyes and uh, there uh, there is a lead laxity also so in this cases we know that if there is lead laxity we should uh, shorten the uh, lead, uh, lead uh, like by the lts but in this type of patients when we just uh, tightening the lead there is uh, it is looking like an ophthalmic lead and sometimes that um, that lacrimal punctum is outside the lacrimal leg so uh, which procedure would be better for this type of patient okay so whenever you are dealing with a lid laxity along with uh, any problem you have to assess where the laxity is whether it is generalized whether it is lateral or whether it is medial if it is a predominantly medial laxity especially where there is a medial canthal tendon laxity then lts may pull pull this out of the uh, lacus so there you have to be cautious there you have to do a medial canthal ligament tightening and in other cases you can do it if you find that medial canthal tendon is not so weak medial canthal tendon laxity means when you pull the lid the the punctum gets stretched almost up to the limbus this implies a medial canthal tendon laxity and there you will have to tighten the medial canthus we'll talk about how to tighten the medial canthus when we talk about telecanthus there is a question on telecanthus so we'll talk yes. about that but uh, lts or even a lateral canthopexy will work if this is a generalized a generalized laxity and it is not associated with a predominant medial laxity if you have a lot of medial laxity then you either do lateral uh, the medial canthal tendon tightening or you do a lazy t procedure where you are causing an interning of the punctum and you are also doing a little tightening with a spindle or lid retractors with a, a small lts procedure or even more often a lateral canthopexy procedure where you are just passing a tightening suture thank you sir thank you sir now i think there are some questions about orbit on orbit okay uh, uh, sir welcome sir uh, thank you very much uh, thank you uh, for letting me participate in sasken webinar sir i have a question uh, that said during orbitotomy uh, with excision of the retrobulbar growth uh, there is always a chance of optic nerve damage and yes. extracular muscle injury yes sir how can we prevent such uh, complication is there any tips sir okay so there are two important things one is the choice of the right procedure based on the location of the tumor so we'll talk about that i'm trying to hunt for my slides on that and sec of course the second important consideration is that you do you want your procedure to be quite aesthetic you do not want it to cause a scar so those two are the main considerations in selecting the approach let me get to the orbit slides okay right so this was another question surgical planning in uh, uh, orbital hemangioma and second question was that we want to avoid the complications so in surgical planning it is important this was your question ocular motility and vision loss problems 
So selecting the right approach is important. So you decide your surgical approach based on which surgical space is occupied, whether it is extraconal or intraconal, what is the side, size and location of the tumor, what is the suspected pathology. Supposing it is a um, malignant, you're suspecting a malignancy, poorly defined tumor or an in inflammatory pathology, then you are just doing an incisional biopsy rather than in planning an excision and you're taking your decision accordingly. So you should take the most direct approach. If the tumor is medial, doing a lateral orbitotomy will not help. Avoid crossing the optic now. Again, if you have a, a lateral tumor, do not go from medial side and go across and, and, and try and dissect the tumor. Of course, as I said, aesthetics is another important goal. So you avoid or hide skin incisions. And increasingly in hemangiomas, even with larger hemangiomas, we are mostly able to go through transcarancular, trans uh, initial inferior phonics approaches in most of the cases. And for anterior locations, we now much more avoid bone removals. Most of the lacrimal gland tumors, we are able to do without bony orbitotomy. We are able to dissect from the anterior approach. So minimally invasive aesthetic approach is important. It is no longer a luxury and Non-visible scar is, a, again, a very important goal now. But these are very important for avoiding the possibility of an injury. Now, this is one aspect. So you have, therefore, the need a lateral lobotomy or a transcranial or a combined approach. So important principles in dissection are that you always do a dissection after you localize the tumor in an anterior-posterior direction. So look at the instrument that we are using. It is only used as cutting in a superficial place. The rest of the places, it is just a di dissector. You can use a blunt spatula as a dissector for the same thing. You always work on the surface of the tumor. You try and keep all your dissection. See if any change takes place when you are doing closer, going closer to the cone. See if you are causing any change in the pupillary shape or pupillary dilatation. Wait for some time. Reduce your pressure. Avoid the pressure at that stage. Wait and then go ahead and do it. So these are the important tips. Working on the surface of the tumor, doing anteroposterior dissection, doing blunt dissection, avoiding blunt dissection, picking up structures by using a cryo, doing a dissection under totally your direct visibility. That is the key to doing a uh, dissection and choosing the right approach, which is as direct as possible. So these are the important things that ensure that you are able to avoid any damage. Thank you, sir. Sir, I have, I have all questions, sir. Sure. Contributions, sir, contribution. My experiences. Yes. The doing here, I think the Dharmoid cyst. Maybe this case is Dharmoid cyst. This turned out to be a neurofibroma. This was, yeah, which we which was coming into it and we could cut it uh, from that. On uh, on Shash, I have on from you that in case of dharma cyst, after exposure, maximum exposure. Previously, I tried to remove whole mass, whole cyst at a time, but now for maximum dissection. I pick at a comfortable position and remove all the materials from the downward cyst. Then remove by navigation method all of the cyst. Yes. So that structure of the orbit not into the mass. Yes, that is That's a very simple tip. Even in hemangiomas, you can cause a little decrease in size by removing some blood from within. Uh, and uh, making a puncture, it works very well that way for hemangiomas, large hemangiomas as well. Very useful tip. I'm not using scissors in orbit uh, very rarely, sir. Yeah, but if but you use uh, scissors, you use it as a dissector. You so notice that I did the same thing because I was cutting the superficial muscle fibers with that and using it only with spreading motion to use as a dissector. Of course, Using a blunt spatula like a lens spatula 
is a much more useful method. I would much rather use that more often these days. I agree with you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mehbu, do you want to take over now? Good afternoon, sir. Ashubhava, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? Gula. How are you, sir? You are doing a hectic program for the last few days. Which program? Hectic programs. Yeah. yeah. There's one in this, this evening also. Sir, I want to share uh, two or three slides. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll just uh, stop share. Sir, it's, it's few challenges uh, to manage uh, uh, chemosis in defined situation in uh, our clinical practice. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Sir, this patient suddenly developed acute uh, chemosis and proptosis after uh, retinal detachment surgery with a uh, silicon oil. Uh, and uh, the patient referred to me, and uh, this is a, a type two chemosis. And another patient, another patient presented uh, with chemosis for the last uh, 15 days, uh, type two chemosis. And CT scan uh, of the orbit uh, showed engorgement of superior ophthalmic vein. Uh, I diagnosed the case in that cavernous cavernous fistula. And another case, uh, this patient uh, presented with uh, proptosis, dystopia, uh, and a type two chemosis. A CT scan showed a large mass and superolateral quadrant of the orbit to uh, medial quadrant of the uh, superior orbit involving the Lachman gland fossa and uh, uh, Osteolytic with osteolytic changes. How we manage, uh, how we solve the chemosis in this situation, sir? See, as you have all already mentioned very well, it is important to recognize what the cause is, first of all. And if, if you have a cause like a tumor, you will most likely have to go ahead with removal of the tumor before you can take care of the drainage obstruction that is taking place, which is leading to this chemosis. Similarly, if there is a AV, mal, um, uh, like you mentioned, if there's an AV fistula that has developed, you will have to take care of that as an important measure. Initially, if you have uh, uh, a cause like a post-operative edema, you use anti-inflammatory, you use enzymes like uh, um, chimeral fort, uh, in order to reduce the edema, reduce the selling, you also take conservative measures to keep this area moist and not let it become very dry, use ointments, use drops, till this subsides on its own if it is post-operative. If there is a cause, then that cause has to be taken care of. And most of the times, by conservative means, in a few weeks' time, you, you get a resolution of the chemosis but there will be resistant cases. And there are some cases where we have needed and tried to do puncture to drain out the fluid, along with trying with an attempt to reposition with a, a few sutures to reposition the phonics. They don't always work. Sometimes you are able to reduce the edema and combined with all the anti-inflammatory therapy that you have, sometimes use of steroids, you are able to take care of it. But at other times, it proves resistant in spite of giving punctures, in spite of trying to get some fluid out of that, and in spite of all the conservative measures. So this is a difficult condition to treat. But as you said yourself, the first and foremost is trying to look for a cause and take care of the cause. Thank you, sir. 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 Another question I can ask. Yes, sir. Sir, sometimes we are facing difficulties to 
reconstruct the medial orbital wall or inframedial orbital strut after the trauma. And uh, this uh, patients may also complain uh, epiphora. How we manage this type of cases? So first, first of all, it is important to evaluate why the epiphora is taking place. If it is uh, an obstruction only of the canaliculi which occurred due to injury, then you have all those options of uh, um, Botox injection or conjunctive or DCR to consider. But if it is a traumatic nasolacrimal tract obstruction, which is much more likely with a large medial trauma that has caused a nasoorbitoethmoid fracture, caused a traumatic telecanthus, these cases you often have associated mucus or mucopus coming out. And in these cases, it becomes imperative first and foremost to take care of the infective pathology because any reconstructive pathology done in presence of pus may itself be more liable to fail or have an infective uh, ramification. So first of all, you take care of the traumatic nasolacrimal duct obstruction. I prefer an external DCR to do that and then um, Make sure, get, make sure that you get into the nose by passing an instrument from the nose, removing all the bone on the way, carrying out an anastomosis as best as you can to create a DCR in these tough cases of traumatic nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And at the same time, sometimes you are able to also do a correction of uh, telecanthus. Maybe I can show some slides on how we correct the, the traumatic uh, telecanthus. But uh, in most cases, you have to first take care of the infective pathology and then I'll just share the screen. And Can you see my uh, slides? Okay, sir. So I'll just try and see if I can find that. Those telecanthus correction slides. So uh, the telecanthus, you know, you have these all these structures in the area of medial canthal tendon. You have the bone, bony problems. You have the medial canthal tendon with its anterior um, and posterior crust, which can all get injured. So if you have a telecanthus which is due to a soft tissue deformity, then you required to reposition the medial canthus or the part of the medial most part which you can get close to the uh, lower tarsus. You need to anchor it to the posterior crest, posterior crest behind the uh, sac. So you have to give a conjunctival incision and use an oblique direction of your scissors to reach the area of posterior lacrimal crest behind the sac. So this is the area of the sac and you reach the periosteum there. You can take a bite if you find the tissue is strong enough. Take a proline bite through that and then take a bite through the medial canthal tendon. And then when you tighten this, you are able to get a good apposition of the medial canthus. And it also gives you a deep positioning of the medial canthus. But this will work in soft tissue injury. So if you have a problem like this, then you often need to combine a YV plasty with a transcarancular approach in order to carry out a fixation of the medial canthal tendon and at the same time do a YV plasty. So this is able to give you good correction in these cases. Sometimes you have a telecanthus, but with a displaced down canthus. So then you can do a Z plasty and take the lower limb of Z in the in above and the upper limb of Z down so that you are able to reach the level of this normal side. So once you do that, you also need to additionally do the fixation of the medial canthus to the bone here. And that we sometimes would use on the medial canthus to the bone as well as the all the rotation of soft tissues. 
So for bony deformities, you need to do a, a low profile knee plate most often. So if you have a defect there, you can sometimes do a transnasal wiring, but most often you have to fix a small uh, titanium plate, usually just two holes or three holes, two to four holes and short screws, which are only about three millimeters or four millimeters, which are drilled super superficially and you are able to get a good correction. Then anchor your medial canthal tendon to this, these holes, either with a proline suture or with a stainless steel wire, thin stainless steel wire, about 28 or 30, so, so that you are able to fixate the medial canthus. But for bilateral cases, you sometimes find a transnasal wiring is very useful. You create that hole adjacent to the anterior lacrimal crest, just superior to posterior lacrimal crest. And you are able to do a transnasal wiring. So this is uh, the use of a mini plate, a micro plate with fixation with, with this suture, which we are doing here. And uh, for a situation like this with a traumatic telecanthus, this girl had bilateral chronic dacrocystitis and traumatic NLDO also. So we did a... a to take care of the DCR as well as to give a good deep position to the medial canvas in this girl. So these are the things that you do. So as somebody had asked, what are the indications for uh, um, um, transnasal wiring? So a bilateral case like this would be very good, very well amenable to a, a transnasal wiring. For unilateral cases, we are able to uh, do it uh, by a microplate. If you don't have bone, sometimes you have to put in a small bone graft also, or find some area of the bone where you can put that microplate. I hope that answers. The okay, I'll stop share. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Mayapur. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, this three years girl uh, came to me uh, for the, this large pigmented lesion. So the, uh, just uh, I need discussion from you and also from Golam Haida, sir, and anyone can participate in it. So what will you do in this case? Tough job. Yes, this sir. is, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you have uh, kissing nevi which are uh, superficial, you are just able to take care of those small areas. When the area is as large as this, it becomes a really difficult position. Because uh, if you are trying to do something like uh, removing the skin and putting an epidermal graft, you risk a lot of problems like a, a contraction of the scar with um, appearance which is not so good. You may get some ectropion because of shrinkage of the graft. And uh, you may get a deformity of the canthal region. So, um, in this situation, I would probably not do any surgical intervention. Talk to plastic surgeons to see if they they have some means of reducing pigmentation by any of the lasers, which can make this, um, uh, or it's one of those uh, superficial derm abrasion kind of procedures which they do with lasers now whether any of the, those can decrease the pigmentation significantly for her. I would avoid doing any surgical intervention. Thank you, sir. Sir, so now, sir. Uh, uh, Narayan has some uh, pocket-related question, I think. Huh? Professor Narayan. Gulam wants to, be going yes. back. Uh, wants to talk. Some of sir. 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 Yes, Professor Gulam. My, op my opinion is that yes. those pigmentations are around the lid, around the lid. We have interfered this by skin graft. Yes. And that it. Then, yes. then after healing and complete, after complete of healing, all the things completed, then I can refer to my surgeon. They will manage other than lid. Yes. This is my opinion. Sir. Yeah. So you need to avoid the lid area. I, I agree entirely with that. Sir, Professor Bitharia, would you do something different? 
No, no, I I agree with you. What you are suggesting? Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Milly. Yes, Naren, she has some enough uh, socket in it. Honorable, respected guest, chairman, co chairman, moderator, and participant. Good evening. I, uh, 40, two years old lady, Bleeding with minor trauma or even is spontaneously. On examination, severe contracted eye and less margin in trupion and inability to retain prosthesis. How can I manage this condition or prevent this situation? Okay, so, so I will uh, go over this scenario again. It is a patient who has had an endoxy appetite integrated. Implant containing an ophthalmic socket, yes. nucleated eye, uh, yes. 20 years back. Yes. But she is only oil. Nowadays, she uh, noticed bleeding, minor trauma, or even spontaneously. And examination contacted, uh, severely contacted socket, and uh, eyeless margin, entropion, and inability to uh, retain prosthesis. So we are dealing with uh, multiple problems. Uh, there are recurrent bleeds. The socket is grossly contracted and prosthesis is not being retained. And uh, because of the contraction of the socket, the lashes are also tending to turn in in you getting an entropy. Now, first and foremost thing to see is what is the status of the conjunctival sac uh, or conjunctiva or the uh, socket lining. So if one, there has there been any exposure of the hydroxyapatite, because that's one of the problems that causes a lot of uh, discharge, a lot of scarring, a lot of contraction. If there is no exposure, makes things much simpler. But you need to see whether there is a, a lot of inflammation of the conjunctiva, irritation of the conjunctiva, and what is the status of the prosthesis. If, if the prosthesis has become rough, if it was customized, non-customized, whether it's causing so much irritation that conjunctiva is grossly irritated, so if it is so, then you need, or, or there has been a granulation formation, which sometimes happens, and which is a common cause of bleeding. Sometimes granulation tissue forms within the uh, socket and causes bleeding. So if you have any of these things, you need to take care of the congestion, you need to take care of the exposure, you need to take care of the granulation tissue, excise it possibly before, and make the socket a little healthier, and then you can assess whether you want to expand the socket by some means by use, use, doing some kind of a mucous membrane grafting if it is a wet socket if it is a dry socket and you may think of a, a, a an epidermal graft so all those possibilities come in once you have made sure what the cause is whether there is irritation and taking care of those things so that comes first making sure that the there is very little inflammation left before you undertake the surgery of some kind of grafting in order to have a better chance of success with your surface addition. Any other Thank case? you, sir. Thank you. Sir, an another uh, problem is recent problem. Uh, that... Yes, uh, not able to hear you. Sir, uh, I'm Dr. Ifat, sir. Uh, very nice to meet uh, you, sir. Sir, can I ask a socket-related question now? I think uh, he's come back. Okay, so. okay sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. I will ask later. Yes. Okay, you, yes. You, you, you yes. Ask your question. Yes. 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 Surgically induce necrotizing sclerosis due to scleral buckling. Give me a, a valuable opinion. So if it is uh, because Painful of... Painful blind eye. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, necrotizing sclerosis. So at that stage, 
first and foremost will be to take care of the cause if there is a very tight buckle or something that is present or whether there is an infection that has taken place infection. so take care of those two factors first make the eye quiet once the eye has become absolutely quiet then you can make a good assessment of what you can do to rehabilitate him from the point of view of giving him the best possible aesthetics but first foremost you have to take care of that necrotizing situation take care of the factor of infections ischemia tight buckle whatever the factors ensure that you have removed them and allowed things to heal for a period of maybe 3 months or even 6 months you want to take a definitive procedure welcome to dr ganga okay, thank you sir to have dog you with us dr ganga uh, sir can we uh, continue for half an hour more oh sir okay thank you sir because the, they have many other questions and there are three questions also in the question answer box so we'll go to do after they finish and we'll we'll listen to the tributary also uh, so that's the thing yes so uh, now i will ask uh, rifat to come with your question sir huh? dr rifat rashid yes madam thank you madam uh, thank you ashok grover sir uh, nice to meet you it's uh, really a pleasure to meet you here uh sir uh, first i will ask the socket related question sir uh, we are dealing with uh, contracted socket but uh, sometimes uh, we do mmg uh, mucous membrane graft and uh, reconstruct the socket and most of the time patient can uh, wear the prosthesis post operatively but uh, we are facing problem when uh, in some cases like post enucleation Uh, retinoblastoma those who had uh, radiotherapy and uh, sometimes we take the large mucous membrane and uh, from uh, sometimes both side we put the large mucous membrane graft uh, for socket reconstruction but still uh, later the patient uh, few of our cases they had again contra contracted socket and uh, sometimes it is really difficult to put the processes so is there any alternative way to do the socket reconstruction or how we can manage this type of cases those okay. who had mostly contracted socket take the help of some slides these uh, these cases are really tough these post irradiation ones they contract they have lot of scarring and any procedure that you do has a much greater tendency to fail because there is a much greater scarring that takes place but uh, yes, uh you end up with sockets looking like this i'll i'll share that with you i'll need to locate where those slides are in this okay so so i spoke about uh, for the previous question and that when you have a uh, prosthetic eye with lot of discharge we spoke about uh, evaluating them well in order to see look for inflammation and any other causes of inflammation including um, malpositions and uh, looking at the prosthesis the edges particularly to see if they, they may be a culprit exposure of hydroxy hepatite implant taking care of uh, exposure taking care of granulation tissue excising it well uh, exposed uh, implant mesh implant so those all need to be taken care of entropion if it is taking place it usually implies like in this implies some kind of con contraction is taking place in the conjunctiva so you need to either do a tarsal rotation procedure if it is mild but many cases will require a graft so um but let's look at your question now which is uh, no it's not here um i'll have i left with just a slit and you really don't have much that you can do in these cases but there are some options which we use including epidermal grafts which we will look at 
these are all pertaining to the questions that had been forwarded to me last evening. So in these cases, thermal graft is one of the, uh, the procedures that works well. So uh, we have an example here where we can use uh, those uh, epidermal grafts in those slits and with a well-retained <coughs> pressure in the area at the same time, which sometimes it is able to work. And uh, you are able to create a reasonable socket to be able to retain the eye, not put the slides, it seems. So epidermal... Sir, uh, okay, is I there any choice of scleral shell technique? Uh, we, I never tried, but uh, scleral shell, shell technique so, to the, uh, take two large MMG uh, and those, cover the conformer. In order to retain the pressure and in order to not allow the contraction to take place. So severe contracture, um, is usually not sufficient for these, it's even although that is the first choice in a wet socket. But split thickness skin grafts, especially in a dry socket like this. So if you have a, just a slit here, you could then retain a prosthesis. Just about six months ago, she's now much older. She's about 12 years now. We did a procedure to recreate her lateral canthus and expanded the palpebral fissure a little. Now she has a larger retained prosthesis. I will need to add those pictures here. But this is much better than the, the near slit that she had earlier. So you're able to help these cases post irradiation once, once sometimes with a procedure like this. But desperate cases, you may need to use an orbital or a spectacle prosthesis. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have another question, sir. Uh, sometimes uh, for surface reconstruction, especially post-surgical, uh, like uh, recurrent pterygium excision or simbliferon release. So some uh, patients uh, have, most of the patient develops recurrent simbliferon. So sometimes we also put the uh, MMG in the bulbar surface also. Still the patient had again recurrent simbliferon. So for those cases, how we can manage? Uh, Again, uh, recurrent cases are yes. cases because there is a greater tendency for fibrosis. Another thing that you should wait for three to six months before you reattempt them because the tendency for tissues uh, to be more reactive and cause more fibrosis is more in the initial few months after any trauma or any surgical intervention. So waiting for a good period of time is important. So these can be very troublesome, affecting your motility, affecting your aesthetics, affecting, causing diplopia. So you have to look at uh, whether it's a localized uh, semblepharon, just anteriorly, posteriorly, or total semblepharon, and make sure that you do it by relieving all the tension, remove all the subepithelial scar tissue and tenons capsule on the conjunctival surface so that the tissue returns to its normal position and then cover with the graft. Now, both options work. The, um, in, especially in younger patients, conjunctival grafts have a much greater tendency to hypertrophy. And mucosa and uh, AMG is a better choice. Yes. Smaller yes. degrees of simplifron where there's just a band, you can just do a procedure like YV-plasty or a Z-plasty, and that is able to take care of it, and you're able to avoid the graft. But for more generalized ones, you need grafting. Wherever conjunctiva can be taken from somewhere opposite eye or the same eye, conjunctiva is the first choice. Um, other cases, mucosa or AMG needs to be used. So you have these kind of options where you can use the phonics so that you have this raw area left and then you are able to put a graft and use a ring conformer to make sure that you do not get a fibrosis in that area and you're able to get decent results. In some other case with a chemical injury here, we also did a, a bit of a limbal cell transplant and did a graft, a, a molten metal injury with a simplifron. Again, tough because of fibrosis. Sometimes a little help can be taken with a um, 
mitomycin C also in these cases. Yes. You can use with a relatively lower dose, conservative dose, and then do your graft. So paraoperatively, so, we can use mitomycin or, or post-op topical? Uh, no, the paraoperative. I per use paraoperative. Okay, uh, but I sir, another question, sir. Point. How long we, we should put the simliferone ring? How long? Uh, depending on the healing, first, let's say, first yes, few weeks, three weeks. But now yes, some sir. softer material uh, simliferone rings, which are better tolerated, are available. So it's much easier to keep them. These uh, simliferone rings, which were made of PMMA, were sometimes more difficult to uh, tolerate and created yes. symptoms to the patient. So all these options are open. So AMG is often a good option in many cases where there is only partial loss because it's, AMG is a substrate graft and it will require the conjunctival cells to come over it where there is a larger duration. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your great opinion. Thank so the you, sir. Principle basically Thank you. have to be followed, remove all scar tissue, wait for an adequate period of time for inflammation to die down, take the help of... Um, Involving the nasolacrimal sac. Uh, we do the DCR operation previously, elsewhere, but there is a recurrent squamosal carcinoma after radiotherapy. And what can we do, sir? So there is a squamous cell carcinoma involving both the upper lid, lower lid, as well as the medial cancel region, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And for the outer upper lid, sometimes a tensile's procedure can work like this. For example, this defect was a little more than half with a, there was a abnormal position of the canthus as well, the lower lid, can, lower canthus was obliterated and the lower lid was attached to a part of the upper lid here. So we opened that up and did a, a tensile's repair, which is fairly good for up to or just about the half uh, defects like it worked in this case. But for larger tumors like this, where you have a big sebaceous carcinoma, which will sacrifice more than two thirds of the upper lid and which will sacrifice the lateral canthus, then you have to use a procedure like a superficial temporal artery-based transposition flap coming from the lateral side. Because it is thick, you sometimes can avoid using an inner lamina. But if you have to uh, support in the inner lamina, then you can use the <coughs> lid which can close at the end. Of course, you can take care, improve the cosmosis further by correcting ptosis and so on. Um, so this is the option for the lateral... Uh, in, but we'll, I'll, I'm yet to answer the question that was asked. So yes, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, along with this, if there is a if model sinus involvement uh, after radiotherapy, then what can I do, sir? It can gap repeatedly, sir. If there is a recurrent involvement. Yes, sir, recurrent involvement. And, has uh, also failed. Now, radiotherapy would have made things even more difficult for us because that, that would mean that the tissues would be would bleed more, there would be greater scarring and uh, tissues would be more fragile. But um, if you have no other option, you'll wait for a little while if the condition of cornea allows you to and then go ahead with a, a reconstruction as best as you can. So... This is that reconstruction. So this was the question. So, but I have instead a basal cell carcinoma that I had. And this lady had been avoiding surgery for almost seven, eight years because she said she, does, she will not get a surgery done. So when I offered her the option of biologics and she heard the cost of the medicine, then she said, nay, I might as well have a surgery. <laughs> So this late, so I almost entire upper lid, entire medial cancel region, and the entire nearly two third of the lower lid. So we excised that and uh, 
there was a defect it had to extend up to the cheek because the extent of the tumor is here so we had to do multiple procedures we had to take a nasal muco cartilage from the opposite side we took a midline forehead flap divided it into two to cover most of this area but we still needed some skin graft here so we have this skin graft here which will uh, improve the color later and divided this into two so that we could get some kind of a reconstruction of this area so you will need to combine many procedures we will need to do more procedures to make her more presentable but uh, right now it has done the job of protecting her eye and she's happy enough she may not get the second procedure done so this is uh, one of the options the midline flaps okay. the periocular flaps are often a help in this situation although they do not give you a very excellent uh, reconstruction like you would have say in lid sharing procedures mm -hmm. okay thank you sir sir another question twins sir. sir my mentor also professor gulam haider sir along with us okay gulam haider sir has left so yes, maybe now we have to see that uh, nishad do you have any questions for sir dr nishad parveen okay sir we have few questions in the question answer box so can i ask a sure. question my by privilege okay thank you sir uh, one question is from swati uh, she asks you how do we manage doses in road traffic accident post facial reconstruction if lps is poor and frontal bone is reconstructed with plate and and flap no frontally thin thing may may not work so how will you do so road sorry. traffic accident when it is a difficult situation you have to make sure that you let all other repairs be done first if there is some a uh, frontal defect and some no, no, no. Hey, plastic surgeon has planned some reconstruction where he wants to put a, a a tissue there or wants to put a tissue or put a synthetic thing like medpore implant there let them complete the job once they have done that then you can reassess and at the end of 6 months if there is reasonable levator function beyond 4 mm 5 mm then do think of uh, a levator procedure otherwise you are most often forced to do a some kind of a sling procedure uh, a frontalis sling procedure and even in the absence of a good frontalis action you are able to get a good elevation by anchoring the uh, tarsal plate to the tissues in front of the uh, in in the forehead region so a frontalis sling would still work it's not entirely dependent on uh, it does cause the anchorage to a higher position even though you may not have a great frontalis action so that may be the thing that you have to take resort to of course looking at all the aspects of protection of the globe and um, all other uh, uh, corneal sensation tear function and all those aspects before you undertake a sling procedure but some the procedure of last resort in these difficult cases is usually some kind of a frontalis sling even if the frontalis action is not great swati i hope you got your answer uh, now there is another question uh, which uh, which company provides the best intubation tube of canali uh, of canalicular dcr and have you faced uh, attachment of the silicon tube from the stainless steel probe while passing it low lower than into the nose down the, into the nose lower down into the nose it does happen so um you have uh, the uh, options available from many manufacturers from whom we can get it in india which are which have the advantage of being relatively cheaper um, but yes we do face difficulties at times gen metal is one and uh, there are several others who are making it uh, the intubation sets and you can get them uh, fairly easily even a pasami i think would give you but uh, uh, yes you do sometimes face this difficulty that 
I mean, you have, and you're pulling it down from the nose, the tube detaches from the probe. Of course, there are some very excellent ones and there are some newer designs, Rittlings and uh, Nunchakus, which make life much easier for you. And they are from FCI and there are some other international companies. So where your patient can afford, then you can use those. And uh, the newer designs are definitely a help in terms of no difficulty in a retrieval with, uh, let's say, a nunchaku uh, intubation set. And uh, you can retain them very easily. Thank you, sir. That's a good solution for this um, question. Uh, Sadia Sultana, she asked, some orbital lesions are uh, histopathologically uh, proved a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but on uh, immunohistochemistry proved a, a typical lymphoid hyperplasia. How we can manage those cases? Now, the lymphoid hyperplasia may respond to uh, steroids, but of course, once the possibility of a lymphoma has been raised, you will have to be on the watch again. Because many of those di diagnosed as lymphoid hyperplasia on repeated uh, histopathology or repeated um, observation do eventually turn out to be uh, lymphoproliferative disease. So keeping that in mind, you can use your uh, steroids or steroid sparing agents such as uh, uh, the immunosuppressive agents and sometimes uh, even radiation. So all those options are open to you. But uh, depending on the response, if they respond easily to steroids, then there is no problem. Uh, it's a good diagnosis for the patient, but do not uh, make him totally free for, from the thought that this could later have turned out to be some kind of a lymphoproliferative disease or, lymph or a lymphoma. Thank you, sir. So that, uh, do uh, Anyone have any question more? More question to ask to sir? Because we'll not like great opportunity for us to have sir for so long with us and we enjoy it. And sir did a lot of work. Look, at this age, sir has prepared the slides and everything for us. And I, I must say, I must tell you that uh, I got, I sent the questions last night. And not last night, not 8 o'clock. It's like maybe 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. And sir prepared the slides. This is what we have to learn from big people like him. So energetic, full of energy. That's why he's a leader. He led us in Asia Pacific, Oklahoma and Reconocative Surgery Society. He's the leader in Asia, South Asia our leader in oculoplasty. He was the leader in OPI and in uh, uh, IOS. So this is, the, this is about down. leadership yes. and energetic. So we want you all to be energetic like sir. This is one learning from this session. Sir, uh, we are at the end of the end of the session. So I would like you to say something about this young uh, ophthalmologist to give them some advice uh, to, our, to me also, so that we can go ahead with our work and do good. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. This is nothing more energizing than being with the younger people and um, communicating with them. So this opportunity was really a uh, a freewheeling discussion <coughs> is really wonderful, a really nice opportunity. And I hope you can continue this forum with the other surgeons so that a uh, lot of younger people will benefit. Pakistan Oculoplastic Society also mm -hmm. started a forum in which uh, they've been interacting with the faculty with their cases and discussing those aspects um, in a one-to-one -one discussion again like this. Dr. Gangadhar recently had a wonderful presentation with the Pakistan uh, Oculoplastic Society on orbital fractures, for which he's a great authority. And uh, uh, these increase in the interactive um, forums between us is one major, major gain. And I think um, that was one of the objectives of creating OPSSA, 
once we have formalized it and once we have completed our registration processes then we will do many more activities including um, opening up the opportunities for fellowships and uh, faculty transfer so that we are able to really benefit the entire region and lift up the activities i think uh, all of us oculoplastic surgeons have to recognize that it is a very very vast subject and you have to keep learning all your life there are number of times even um, every year now every alternate ot where i have to read up or where i have to watch the surgery on the uh, youtube or because it's a procedure which i have not done before or which i am doing uh, or where there is a new lesion involved or a new pathology involved or where there where i have to do some improvisation to uh, improve so there is a lot of variety and lot of uh, uh, different conditions different pathologies in the orbit lacrimal and um, eyelids and you always need to be on your toes in order to um, be able to do the best for the patient which is the objective so um, that internal drive to do